Hey everyone, in a previous video we explored how overdrive affects anti-squat. In this video, let's look at how steepness and incline interact with overdrive. On this channel, we explore the science of our grown-up toys. First, what is overdrive? It means your front wheels are spinning faster than your back wheels. Underdrive is the opposite, front wheels turning slower. In RC, overdrive is pretty common. Full-scale vehicles are too heavy and it would destroy tires and drivetrains too quickly. RC car vehicles are light enough that you can have overdrive and it works and it provides a traction benefit in the right situations. You can achieve overdrive through gearing or electronically if you have dual motors. So let's review exactly what is front overdrive. If you have 30% overdrive, it means your front wheel rotates 1.3 times relative to the one rotation in the rear. Now, there's several ways to calculate overdrive, percent difference, percent change, percent increase. For this, we'll just assume percent increase, which is 30% overdrive means 30% more rotation in the front. That means a 0.3 difference between front and rear or a one-third additional rotation in the front. To help visualize, you don't even have to be rolling forward. You can assume the back wheel is stopped and the front wheel still wants to rotate one-third of a rotation. Take it one step further, you can assume that the back wheel wants to rotate backwards one-sixth of a rotation and the front wants to rotate forward one-sixth of a rotation. That'll help you understand how the two wheels work against each other. It's like driving with the rear brakes on. Or it's like full-time or automatic dig, if you know what dig is. Except that you don't have any control over turning the dig on and off. What happens with overdrive is the rear shocks start to compress, the chassis lowers, your wheelbase stretches, and the wheels start to scrub. The wheel with the less weight pushing on it is the one that scrubs or slips first. But having the two wheels work against each other causes your traction to go up. Something has to give. If one of the wheels didn't slip, your car would divide in half, there would be a vortex or a black hole, and the whole universe would cave in. Let's start with this as an example. Most crawlers have a 60-40 weight bias. That seems to be the sweet spot. Personally, I like 65 degrees, but let's just assume these are the numbers for this demonstration. 60% of the weight is on the front wheel, 40% of the weight is on the back wheel. When that happens, the front wheel has more downforce and more traction, which means the rear is gonna be more likely to break traction or lose traction. So if your vehicle weighs 2,500 grams, that's gonna be 1,500 grams in the front and 1,000 grams of downforce in the rear. Friction analysis is surprisingly simple. In fact, so simple, you're probably not gonna believe me. Friction only has two variables. The primary factors that contribute to the coefficient of friction are surface roughness and tire compound. Elements that are not variables are things like air pressure, tire width, tire diameter, speed, contact patch size, and syrup. They're just simply not in the equation. Some of these factors may improve traction for other reasons than friction, and maybe we'll do another video on that. So this is the equation for static friction. It's the normal force, which is this blue force pointing straight down, uh, can also be known as downforce. In this case, this downforce is coming from mass times gravity. It's merely the weight of your truck pushing down against the ground. And you multiply that by uh, this constant, which is the coefficient of friction constant. And if your wheels aren't slipping, it's the static coefficient of friction. And that equals your total frictional force. Nothing is coming from wings or blown floors or ground effects or aerodynamics. In this case, the normal force is merely your weight pushing down in the vertical direction. If your wheel is slipping, then it's the same basic equation, only you're using the coefficient of kinetic friction instead of static friction. Now, because this normal force or this down force is coming from gravity, 
It only acts vertically. When the terrain starts to be sloped, then you have to break down what's called the vector components. Your normal force now is the force perpendicular to the angle of the slope. So you lose some of your down force. The normal force is never as high as your down force on an angle. The equation for your normal force, this orange force, is pretty basic trigonometry. Cosine of the angle or a squared plus b squared equals c squared also works. Basically, if you have a thousand grams of down, down force, you're only getting about 71% of that force pushing into the slope, adding to your traction or frictional force. Now, I made this parametric model in my CAD software just to help with the uh, math quickly. So let's look at an example. If you're going up a 20 degree slope, your weight shift is going to change because the distance from the center of gravity to your front wheel changes. This ratio from front to rear changes. Now, these are just some sample numbers uh, to get you started. Your actual center of gravity location is and its height is going to be different on every vehicle, but this will give you an idea what happens. Notice that I'm not doing the vector components just because both wheels are at the same 20 degree angle, so we'll just simplify the analogy and leave that off for now. Uh, you will notice that I did move the force to uh, the center of the contact patch. That's where the force is pushing down, not directly under the axle. So at 20 degrees, you have 52% of the force on the front, 48% on the rear. If you look at the actual numbers, that's about 1,300 grams in the front and 1,200 grams in the rear. You can see these weights are starting to get closer and closer together. Now let's look at 40 degrees. The vehicle is still set up with a 60-40 weight distribution when it's level, but now when you're at 40 degrees, these numbers actually flip, which is kind of a coincidence, but at 40 degrees, you now have 60% of your weight on the rear wheel and 40% of your weight on the front wheel. Opposite of what it was when the vehicle was level. And if you look at the actual numbers, that puts 1,000 grams on the front wheel and 1,500 grams on the rear wheel. Now, the reason this is important is because, remember, you now have more downforce in the rear and less downforce in the front. So your front wheel is more likely to slip, which means overdrive is not going to be effective once you have more weight in the rear. So what's the actual balance point when it's exactly 50-50? Well, it's 22 degrees. And again, these are just sample numbers to give you an idea how it works. At 22 degrees, you have the exact same amount of downforce in the front as you do in the rear. Now let's look at what happens at 65 degrees. This is really steep. Now you've only got 13% of your weight on the front wheel and 87% of the weight pushing down on the rear wheel. But again, 87% of the weight is not the normal force that's pushing into the surface. It's something less than that. Let's take a closer look at the exact numbers. If you've got 2,200 grams pushing on the rear wheel, that's 87% of your total weight, 2,500 grams. When you do the vector components, you've only got 930 grams pushing against the surface. So this is the number you would use to calculate your frictional force. As you can see, your frictional force goes down real fast. And you've now got more, more force pushing the vehicle down the slope than you do pushing it into the slope, creating traction. Now let's look at the absolute maximum balance point. Again, this is just an example. At 68 degrees, for this center of gravity location, at 68 degrees, you have 100% of your weight on the rear wheel and zero weight on the front wheel. That means the slightest bit of throttle is either going to flip you over or the back wheel has to slip. One of those two things has to happen. Now, a lot of times you can still climb up 68 degrees, 70, 75 degrees if your wheels are spinning. So if you drive like a drift car or a rally car and you've got a four wheel spin, you can still go up an incline uh, if your wheels are spinning. If you have high traction, your vehicle is most likely just going to flip over at these high angles. 
the weight bias is only part of the story. Rear torque is the other part. These numbers only reflect the static weight balance. When you add the effect of rear torque, the front wheel force can only go down, meaning the front gets lighter. Here's why. The torque at your rear wheel is going to want to unweight the front end. That's the only thing it can do. Whether you're going fast or slow, high torque, low torque, high traction environments, your front end is going to unweight and lift up under rear torque. Eventually, the front end is going to lift. Now, this has proven very controversial, but it is fact. There are no physical mechanisms that can push the front end down. No version of rear anti-squat can push your front end down. It can only unweight and lift up. Anti-squat is not going to change that. If you want to know more about that, check out my definitive guide to anti-squat on RC crawlers. Now, my video on anti-squat really enraged a lot of people. Anti-squat cannot and does not push the front end down. It doesn't even hold the front end down. It simply prevents the rear shock from extending, giving you the illusion that it's holding the front end down. You simply can't add downforce through rear anti-squat linkage. Plus, anti-squat is only produced under pronounced acceleration and not at slow or constant speeds. Let's take a look at a couple variations, lower center of gravity and forward weight bias. Imagine we change our weight bias. It was 4060. Let's put more weight in the front. We move some components forward, we add some brass. You've now got 65% in the front and 35% in the rear. What effect does that have? Well, you've now got 1625 grams on the front, whereas before you had 1500. So it changes your weight bias. If you look at it on a slope, your 50-50 balance point is now 31 degrees, whereas before it was 22 degrees. So adding more weight forward makes a pretty significant difference in the angle of your weight bias. What happens if you lower your center of gravity by, let's say, 10 millimeters? Still 60-40 front to rear, but a lower center of gravity by 10 millimeters. Well, that does give you a benefit, but it's a smaller benefit. It brings you to about 25 degrees slope, whereas before it was 22. So lowering the center of gravity also helps, but not as much as moving your weight forward. So if overdrive gives up so easily, 22 degrees can erase it. Does it help at all? Imagine that you're climbing over a, uh, a hill and your front wheel breaks over or crests the peak. Your vehicle is at 22 degrees, okay? In space, the vehicle's at 22 degrees, which was your 50-50 weight distribution. Look at the front wheel. Your front wheel is now at zero degrees, so all of the normal force, all of the vertical weight is pushing straight down against the terrain. The back wheel is still climbing up this steep force. Again, remember, the vehicle is at 22 degrees, but this slope that the rear tire is still on is 40 degrees. Then you have to apply the vector components to figure out what the actual downforce in the rear is. In this case, you've got 2,500 grams, and the front wheel is half of that because none of it is lost to vector components. It's all pushing straight down into the ground. In the rear, because it's still pushing down at 40 degrees, you only have 960 grams. So even though the weight bias is 50-50, the terrain is at different angles, and your actual downforce at each wheel is significantly different. 1,250 grams, you're still getting quite a bit of traction in the front, which means you're getting overdrive in the front, which is pulling this rear wheel up with a lot of positivity. Now you should have a pretty good understanding of how and when overdrive works.